In previous videos, I've covered how the Bragg Gray theory can be used to convert dose to air at a point to dose to water. This time I'm going to be covering how it applies to percentage depth dose curves that have been measured using ionization chambers. The Bragg Gray relation allows us to obtain dose to water from a measurement of dose to air by multiplying the dose to air by the ratio of stopping powers in water and air. I mentioned previously that this stopping power ratio varies with electron energy. Within a roughly clinical range of 0.2 MeV to 30 MeV, stopping powers tend to increase with energy. The water stopping power increases like this, and the air stopping power increases like this. But notice how the air stopping power increases more rapidly with energy than that of water. This is due primarily to the density effect. Stopping power tends to increase more slowly when material density is high. The density effect effectively slows down the rate of stopping power increase with electron energy. So air, being less dense, is less influenced by the density effect. So the stopping power tends to rise more quickly than it does in water, which has a higher density. So the actual ratio, stopping power in water divided by stopping power in air, tends to decrease with electron energy. This is because the stopping power in air, which is the denominator, increases more rapidly with energy than the stopping power in water. This becomes extremely clinically relevant if electron energy within the beam, or therefore the stopping power, varies with depth. This would mean that the rate at which the dose to air varies with depth, dose to air being the quantity that we can measure with an ionization chamber, would change at a different rate to dose to water with depth. This can lead to inaccuracy in percentage depth dose curves measured using ionization chambers. We need to apply corrections in order to account for this, which come in the form of depth dependent stopping powers. In the fall off region of photon beams, secondary electron energy doesn't change very much. This is because photon beams tend to experience a reduction in the number of photons in the beam with depth rather than energy. There may be some small variations in energy in the fall off region, due to beam hardening in the phantom or patient, or the buildup of scattered photons with depth, but it's small enough that the stopping power ratio doesn't change much with depth, it's generally well within 1%. This results in very small dose errors in percentage depth dose curve measurement, so we generally don't apply depth dependent stopping power ratio corrections. The build-up region is a different story though. Measurements using ionization chambers, especially cylindrical chambers, can be extremely inaccurate in this region. This may be due to differences in electron energy, possibly due to electron contamination from the treatment head, or the fact that secondary electron equilibrium doesn't exist in the build-up region, which could result in slightly higher secondary electron energies on average. And this one applies primarily to cylindrical ionization chambers, but there may also be inaccuracies in the detector effective point of measurement in the build-up region as well. Since this effective point of measurement is generally chosen to be accurate within the fall-off region, under the assumption that there'll be a small, consistent dose gradient across the chamber volume. Electron beams, on the other hand, lose energy consistently with depth, and the water-to-air stopping power ratio increases as energy drops, so the stopping power ratio increases with depth. The magnitude of the variation depends on the beam energy. Since a higher energy beam starts with more energy, and loses more in total across its range as it travels, so the total variation in stopping power ratio tends to be greater, up to around about 15% across a 20 MeV beam. This means that dose to air, or the ionization that we measure when measuring a percentage depth dose curve, varies at a different rate with depth to dose to water, which we are attempting to derive from our measured depth ionization curve. So we need to correct for these differences in order to obtain a PDD curve that reflects dose to water. Let's look at how the shape of depth ionization curves, or percentage depth dose to air curves, differ from typical PDD curves, or percentage depth dose to water curves. We'll use a 20 MeV PDD shape as an example. Depth ionization curves have a very similar shape to percentage depth dose curves. The differences are quite subtle, but at the surface of this beam, the stopping power ratio of water to air is roughly 0.9, and at the practical range it's around 1.25. There's a fairly steady increase in stopping power ratio between the surface and the practical range. So since the stopping power ratio is lower close to the surface, the percentage depth dose to water curve is going to have a slightly lower value than the depth ionization curve. But as depth increases, the stopping power ratio becomes greater than 1, and the depth dose curve becomes greater than the depth ionization curve. The actual percentage difference between ionization and dose increases with depth, with dose to water being, let's say, 25% greater than dose to air. But the actual gross difference in dose that we see as a percentage of the dose at d max is much smaller in the order of 3 to 4 percent. This is because in order to obtain depth dose, we multiply the depth ionization by the stopping power ratio. And since the ionization values are quite small at these depths, even though the stopping power ratio is larger, the final result is still quite small. If you'd like to apply these corrections yourself, there's a formula available in the IAEA TRS 398 Dissymmetry Code of Practice. You can find it in Appendix B 4.1. Everything that I've said so far about percentage depth dose curve corrections in electron beams is applicable to curves measured using ionization chambers. 
When using diodes, though, the situation is very different. The active volume of a diode disseminator is made of silicon, which has a density that's much closer to water than that of air. And since the change in stopping power ratio with energy is mostly due to the density effect, the similar densities of the two materials result in a similar change in stopping power in silicon and water with energy. So at a given energy, the stopping power in silicon and the stopping power in water are not the same, but the rate at which the stopping power in silicon varies with depth or energy is very similar to that of the stopping power of water. So the ratio of these two things, which vary at approximately the same rate with depth or energy, stays very similar when these things change. There may be some slight variation, but in practice we generally don't feel a need to apply these corrections since the error introduced is small, and in radiation dosimetry, corrections applied to reduce small errors can potentially introduce more uncertainty than they remove.